Welcome to the video presentation for Chapter 51. Uh, this is regarding care of the patients with hear, hearing problems and ear problems. It's important to remember that um, the ears are not only responsible for hearing and, and how we communicate with the world, but they're also um, responsible for a lot of our balance. Um, the inner ear pieces of the inner ear our inner ear have a lot to do with our balance. Um, so different kinds of disorders can affect our hearing and our balance. Make sure you do a quick review of chapter 50 um, about the assessment of a patient with hearing problems. Uh, things like assessing for vertigo, dizziness, um, you know, assessing for hearing ability, um, and how to um, kind of assess that and manage a patient with hearing problems. Also, look at some of the things regarding irrigating the ear um, for, for cerumen removal, things like that. So just make sure you kind of look through that chapter and, and review that information. So Meniere's disease is the first disorder of the ears that we are going to discuss. Um, three major features of Meniere's disease, tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, one-sided sensorineural loss, which means loss of hearing in one side, and vertigo. And it's a, an extreme vertigo, which means extreme dizziness. Exact cause is unknown. Um, there seems to be an excess of fluid uh, that can distort the entire inner ear canal system. So it's an excess of fluid um, typically occurs um, related to an infection or allergic reaction or some kind of fluid imbalance. People with Meniere's tend to have exacerbations. They can have good days and bad days. It varies in intensity. Um, sometimes people have the tinnitus, which is worse than the vertigo. Some people have vertigo worse than the tinnitus. So that's a different varying degrees. Um, the, the tinnitus can be extremely annoying um, and really bothersome to a patient. Um, and it usually gets worse with each attack. Hearing loss occurs first with the low frequency tones and then it worsens over time. Um, the vertigo is an extreme vertigo and it's like the, the kind of vertigo where you feel like the room is spinning, they have difficulty ambulating because they're so dizzy, it's very intense and typically they have to lay down. Um, and so it's, it can cause some nausea and vomiting as well. Treatment for Meniere's disease um, can be nutrition therapy or drug therapy. Nutrition therapy um, consists of a diet called a high drops diet. High drops diet is listed on page 1096 in chapter 51, and it talks about um, just different ways to distribute the fluid throughout the day. Um, they definitely need to um, drink adequate amount of, sugar, of fluids with fat, low in sugar, avoid caffeine, limit alcohol intake, um, and avoid foods containing MSG, distribute the food and fluid and take evenly throughout the day. Um, other things they can do is make sure they just kind of move slowly, don't do sudden movements that can kind of decrease the vertigo. Drug therapy is typically medications that are used to reduce, reduce vertigo. Um, those meds can be, some of them are over the counter too, the Dramamine, um, antivert or, or meds that can use, be used to treat vertigo. Um, we can treat the nausea and vomiting with phenergan and zofran if needed. Um, typically, it's, they try to manage these patients non-surgically, um, just try to treat them for the dizziness. And, um, and typically, people are pretty functional um, they, until they have their exacerbations. Um, but it does come and go. The healthier they are, the less frequent the exacerbations typically. They usually will only do surgery if a patient cannot be managed non-surgical, um, you know, if it's really something that is affecting their life and they can't manage it any other way, they'll do some surgeries. And a lot of the surgeries are aimed at dispelling the fluid, so um, creating a pathway to keep the fluid from um, increasing in the inner ear area uh, to decrease the signs and symptoms. So the picture of an acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuromas are typically benign. Basically, they're a tumor of the cranial nerve 8. Um, basically, as I said, they're benign um, and usually 
they just cause damage from kind of impending on other structures um, and they can cause hearing loss if they are um, putting pressure on areas um, of the of the ocular um, not the ocular nerve but the the hearing nerves um, and can cause um, it can also cause neurologic manifestations as it gets larger these are typically diagnosed with CT scan and basically they've got to get in there and get that um, tumor out so it can decrease the the damage that it's causing on other organs in that area um, and decreasing, they want to try to decrease any of those neurological deficits um, and it preserve hearing the best they can. So, like I said, typically it's diagnosed with CT scan. Sometimes it's found when somebody's having a sudden hearing loss or sudden neurological deficits. Um, so surgical management is, is, you know, just monitoring for infection and monitoring per, for preservation of the neurological um, organs. So this is just a visual of um, the anatomy of hearing loss. There's two different kinds, or you can have mixed. Um, conductive hearing loss is typically um, on the outer ear, as you can see in this portion right here. This is a conductive hearing loss where that typically occurs, and it's usually when sound waves are blocked from contact with the inner ear, so if there's something um, blocking that, and you have your sensory neural, which is the inner ear, um, if that's the cause of the hearing loss, it's sensory neural, that's usually more permanent. Um, and if there's any damage to any of these organs in here is when you're going to have sensory neural, and those are diff more difficult to treat. You can't have a mixture. They can have both. Um, and those are, of course, a little bit more difficult to treat as well. Conductive hearing loss can be caused by an inflammation or obstruction of the external or middle ear. Sometimes it's just a foreign object or just some wax in there. Um, and sometimes it's like an infection, and typically that can be treated pretty pretty easily, and, and can the hearing loss can be reversed. Sensory neural hearing loss is like I said, when the inner ear or the auditory nerve, cranial nerve eight, is damaged, um, and that's a lot of times related to prolonged exposure to noise, ototoxic substances, maybe some medications such as maybe genomycin. Um, Meniere's disease is another one that we just talked about. An acoustic neuroma could be another cause of it. These are all listed on page 1098, table 51, to the different causes for these different types of hearing losses. It's just important to understand that there are different causes and that way they are treated appropriately. you got to identify what kind it is and then treat it appropriately. Again, these are signs and symptoms of hearing loss. Uh, the, again, we already talked about tinnitus, ringing in the ears, vertigo, um, and then they'll start to notice that they have difficulty hearing. They feel that the patient is mumbling. Um, Presbycusis, I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but it's basically the sensorineural hearing loss that occurs as a result of aging. Um, that, and that is something that occurs normally. It's just as we age, um, the ability to hear, can, we can lose um, the ability with which we hear as we get older, just like sight. As we get older, we sort of, our sight kind of changes. Um, not a lot we can do for that. There is There are hearing aids, uh, a lot of different things out there these days that we can use to help a patient who has hearing loss. And the important thing to understand is just that it's, it's really detrimental to a patient to feel like they can't be part of a conversation. They have to keep asking people to repeat themselves and things like that. So we want to get them the ability to be able to communicate well. Diagnostic test, tuning fork, otoscope, imaging will be the CT scan to see if there's any tumors. The tuning fork, I don't know if you've seen that used before, they kind of, um, it's just a little uh, tool that they use to hit it, to vibrate it, and then it makes like a little flutter noise from the vibration and just to determine whether the patient can hear it or not. And the thing about it is it's, um, they can tell if it's a conduction or um, a sensor or neural hearing loss using a tuning fork. Otoscope is just what we use. It's a lighted scope that we look in the ear and we can look at the tympanic membrane to see if there's an infection, if there's any obstruction in the ear canal. Imaging is CT scan we already talked about. Audiometry is just a test. You probably remember 
doing audiometry when we were a kid, you know, you raise your hand if you hear the tone, and then there's certain levels of decibels um, just to determine the degree of hearing loss. And really what you need to review here is um, just types of interventions and just early detecting what's going on, you know, detecting that a patient is not able to hear you, um, and then getting them the consults that they need to determine, you know, exactly what's going on. Um, a lot of hearing, a lot of safety measures, you will need to, um, you know, just think of all those things. If you have a patient who has a hearing loss, how you can um, best kind of work with that patient to make sure they can they get the communication that they need. Do you need someone to come in and, and be an interpreter as far as sign language, things like that? Um, you need to be asking those questions because you want to make sure that the patient um, is able to communicate and understands exactly what's going on. Um, and getting them those consults, like for hearing aids and plants, there's lots of different things they can do these days for a patient who has a hearing loss or a hearing impairment. Um, so just make sure you review a lot of that in, the, in Chapter uh, 51 about how to manage a patient and communicate well. On um, page 1103, there's a table or a chart, 51A, that talks about communicating with a hearing-impaired patient. Uh, make sure you look through that and understand um, you know, nursing interventions and care of a patient that has this problem. Other suggestions are listed here for communication techniques and community resources. Make sure they get, you know, support groups, classes, you know, if it's a newly diagnosed patient who um, is having a hearing loss, you know, maybe they need to get some, to some classes as far as lip reading, sign language, things like that. And that concludes chapter 51.